Hey guys, this is MJ at His Truly, locating and educating prodigals at risk. And this is my Tootsie. She's trying to get away from me. I just wanted you to see how cute she is. She just turned five yesterday. Okay, anyway, she's my little watch girl. She washes and waits with me. But um, I know my last video was long, um, 25 minutes. But as soon as I was getting off and wrapping it up, the Lord put it on my heart to come back on. So blame it on him. <laughs> Don't blame it on me. Anyway, so I've had a lot of comments um, about, you know, sleeping and how the enemy is messing in nightmares, you know, messing with your head in nightmares and stuff. And that used to happen to me. I used to have like a paralyzing nightmare where I could actually see my body laying on the bed and I was trying to wake myself up. Okay. And um, plead the blood of Jesus before you go to sleep. Okay. Plead the blood of the lamb over yourself. Anoint your bed. Anoint your house. Uh, welcome the Holy Spirit. I welcome the Holy Spirit into my house, and I say only the Holy Spirit can abide in this home. Okay, um, the Bible says in Revelation, Rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Those spirits are subject to us. Okay, I don't go around talking to those spirits, um, but they got to know who you are, and they got to know that you know who you are. Okay. <laughs> Um, they said, uh, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know, but who are you? You know, know who Jesus Christ is. Know who you are in Jesus Christ. Okay. Know who you are. That is so very important. I have linked in the last, I haven't done it yet, but I'm going to do it after I get off of here. I'm going to link, um, who we are in Christ in the description box. Okay. So yeah, but the Lord had me, um, wanted me to share this with you um, while you were sleeping. This is from My Poetic Justice, the second book. And let me find my glasses here. While you were sleeping, my mighty angels stood guard at your bed, waiting for divine orders as your destiny was read. While you were sleeping, my mighty angels victoriously battled and fought. Your blanket was the blood of Jesus. Your soul had already been bought. She's mine, mocked the enemy. She's taken so many wrong turns. So what she accepted you as savior? Her deeds say that she will burn. So what she knelt at an altar once, believing you were real? My demons now control her thoughts. She has accepted another deal. While you were still sleeping, the Son of God appeared in all, his, all of his glory. Satan once again, for the record, this is the final story. She has inherited my salvation, not by works or deeds. Regardless of the lies that you tell her, my blood has already set her free. One day soon, my beloved will awaken, fully aware of the damage that you've done. She will walk in my resurrection power and command every demon to run. Ephesians 5, 13 and 14, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible for it is light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. All right, and this channel is um, for prodigals. You know, anybody is welcome. But I want to do some housekeeping first. Um, housekeeping is that um, simply if you're in the house. Okay, if you're not in the house of God right now, if you're not a born-again believer, if you do not believe that Jesus Christ is your Savior and um, is the atonement for your sin, um, if you have not received the gospel of your salvation yet, I urge you, do it now. Do not wait. You will be sorry if you wait. That's not a threat. That's a promise. The gospel is good news. It's 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, that Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried, and on the third day rose again according to scripture. And God has made it so very easy for us to become Christians, to become believers, to get born again, to come into the family of God. Okay, how do you get into the family of God as a son or daughter of God? Simple as the ABCs. A is to admit that you're a sinner in need of a savior. B is to believe that Jesus Christ is that savior, that he died for your sins on a cross bled, lived a perfect life, God became man and dwelt among us. 
God became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Okay? And see, call upon his name. That's all we need to do. Believe. That is the key. Believe and embrace that truth. And once we do that, we become Christians. We become children, sons or daughters of God. Okay? And the Bible says that, you know, we're, we're all creations of God, but we're not, you know, we're not all children of God. Not until we come into the house. Okay? The citizenship. Our citizenship is in heaven. Okay? And there are many of us prodigals out there running whose citizenship is in heaven. And we're, the rapture is about to happen, guys. Momentarily. Momentarily. It could happen before this video is finished. But, um... God wants you to know you need to come home because the enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy, and he does not care if you're a Christian, especially if you're a Christian. He doesn't want you here, okay? And um, all the lies that he's telling you, you need to un let Jesus Christ unravel those lies. He's a liar. He came to steal, kill, and destroy, and he did a pretty good job in my life doing that, but, but God, okay? So anyway, um, the definition of a prodigal this is out of the first book. I alternate from one book to another if you don't uh, notice that already. When I asked God to define exactly who a prodigal was, he said that a prodigal is simply a child of his who erroneously believes that he's left the church when the church simply can't be left. I suppose I could explain the suspicious feeling most prodigals have that someone's following us. To illustrate the false doctrine that a believer can forfeit his salvation, I want you to imagine with me the absurdity of a woman given physical birth only to place the child back inside the womb because of imperfections or because the child simply just didn't measure up to her standards. Certainly we can all agree on how ridiculous that sounds, not to mention physically impossible. So like it, likewise it is with spiritual birth. God does not viciously throw away what he's formerly breathed life into. Why would a God of love abort his own child for any reason whatsoever. It is imperative that we understand that the true status of an heir was never contingent upon our meager contribution to the family, regardless of how good or talented we think we are, for none of us had anything of value to contribute in the first place. At the moment of salvation, we entered into the promised inheritance by virtue of receiving Christ's atoning sacrifice alone. Nothing more and nothing less. Long before my experiential reality reflected the true nature of my positional inheritance, I was securely seated in heavenly places with Christ. Unfortunately, as is the case with most of us, I needed to experience the deadly grip of sin's power over me before awakening to the blessed revelation that Christ completely destroyed that power. Furthermore, just as Christians do nothing at all to inherit eternal life than simply becoming born again, we do nothing at all to receive that awful sinful nature that we all share, apart from simply being born into this corrupt and fallen world. The difference between victory and defeat upon this earth is up to me. If I don't reckon my flesh dead, crucified with Christ, as he commands me to, it will eventually kill me. Regardless of how intense our present day struggle is with sin, God has called each of his children to receive unreservedly and experientially the complete inheritance, but it is only by honestly admitting defeat that we are able to receive it. Only then does the door open to complete understanding of the Father's grace. Victory doesn't come by trying harder, but rather in giving up. For only when we completely surrender to our powerlessness over sin do we realize that the battle was never ours to win or lose. I'm going to read that again. Victory doesn't come by trying harder, but rather in giving up. For only when we completely surrender to our powerlessness over sin, do we realize that the battle was never ours to win or lose. That victory belongs to Christ and Christ alone. John 1, 3, they are reborn. This is not a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan. This rebirth comes from God. God is not a man that he should lie, and that which the Spirit has birthed, his Spirit has birthed, will eventually bring him glory. Some of his children just take longer to bear fruit than others. That's all. 
It saddens my heart to witness how some religious folks totally misrepresent the Father's gracious character by legalistically threatening prodigals with the Father's wrath. I'm happy to report that my inheritance was never dependent upon an external system of rules and regulations that I learned governed by the church, but by Jesus Christ's very own pledge to save me to the uttermost. Father affectionately described his true prodigal as a Christian, born of his spirit, having for reasons much like my own allowed Jesus Christ to remain waiting upon the front porch, knocking at a door that already belongs to him. Upon this porch, our Savior patiently waits for an invitation inside, unwelcome and invisible to his own. Yet, he continues to gently knock, breathing just enough life into our homes to sustain us even for just one more day. Some of us refuse to answer that door or even accumulate the skills to hear the knock until our lives depend upon it. And many of us die while in the process of ignoring it. Without the knowledge of his love and the ability to integrate that love into our daily lives, we are all his orphans, drifting aimlessly in a foreign land, seeking love and acceptance in various pig pens never meant to provide sustenance for our soul. In desperation, we cling to the world's illusion, embracing the lie that this time it'll be different. This time, sin will fulfill us. <laughs> Looking to externals, we neglect a God-given ache, crying out from deep within the core of our beings, pleading with us to simply surrender and trust the Father's intentions bidding our hearts the opportunity to learn and fully receive of the inheritance. It is only when we stop searching outside of ourselves that we discover the Father's matchless ability to fill that aching void from the inside out. Only when we wait upon God with expectancy, trusting that Jesus Christ is who he says he is, that he reveals the majesty of his divine character. And only when we hunger and thirst for his righteousness, Realizing that ours is but filthy rags, will he clothe us with a concrete understanding that those years spent in the wilderness were simply essential building blocks to our growth and development. Only there in that quiet place of desperation do we glimpse the birthright we deemed hopelessly lost. Tragically, a remnant of prodigals will remain locked in the cellar of their souls, chained to the gripping darkness without so much as a window view oblivious that just a few steps higher awaits the glorious upper room. Inside that heavenly room, located within our very own spirit, is where we discover the sacred silhouette of the one who holds the key to our destiny. And in his hands, the sacred treasures our enemy hoped we'd never discover upon this earth. The chapters of this book are designed to be a roadmap directing the faltering steps of any willing prodigal, inspiring him to believe that nothing is impossible for those who courageously open up the door and behold his sacred silhouette. Luke fifteen twenty. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great far way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. That's our Father. That's our Heavenly Father. When we stop running and we look inside and wait and be still, the full revelation will be made known. He shows us. He's the truth. He's the light. He's the life and the way. He is also the light. He enlightens and shows us where the enemy led us down a wrong road what the lies are that the enemy led us to believe. That enemy has no power over us. You need to know that. No power unless you give it to him. Take it back. Return to sender. Okay, I'm going to jump off of here. I know you guys have heard enough from me today. Um, I will be back. <laughs> anyway, Jesus is coming back very soon, guys. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, do not wait. The tribulation is something you don't want to be in. And if you don't know what the tribulation is, read the book of Revelation. We won't be here after the third, fourth chapter. Anyway, guys, God bless you. Um, until next time, look up. Our redemption draweth nigh. God bless.